Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us uh, for White House by the Sea, A Century of the Kennedys at Hyannisport. Author Kate Story is here with us to discuss her brand new New York Times bestselling book, White House by the Sea, A Century of the Kennedys at Hyannisport in this Zoom webinar. And Kate's book provides a sweeping history of an American dynasty that has left an indelible mark on our nation's politics and culture. So Kate is the senior features editor at Rolling Stone. She, is she was previously a staff writer at Esquire where she covered culture and politics and has written long form profiles and narrative features for Vanity Fair, Town and Country and many other publications. And we won't hold this against her uh, here in Massachusetts but she lives in New Jersey with her family. We again want to thank the Corning Foundation and the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. So all uh, 150 plus of us who are watching live and the many more that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Kate for joining us tonight. And Kate, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Robert, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for all of you to being here. It's amazing to see um, people from so many places, including the Cape and Hyannis Port in Florida, which is where I grew up. Um, and I'm so excited to, to be here tonight talking to all of you. Um, I've been talking about the book. It's been out for a few weeks now, and it's been so incredible to talk to audiences about this book, which I started back in the fall of 2019. Um, I was working at Esquire magazine at the time, and I had just written an article about JFK Jr.'s George magazine, which some of you may remember was a magazine that covered pop culture and politics. I had written that magazine article. I'd I write I cover a lot of topics. I have a very broad beat with pop culture and politics and I've done entertainment and a little bit of everything. And that's, I really, that's a story that stood out. It's a story I really loved working on. I really loved writing. Um, and I was approached by a book agent who talked to me about possibly working on a bigger project about the Kennedys and Hyannis Sport specifically, their time in Hyannis Sport. And my first reaction was that it sounded like a book that I certainly would want to read. It was sounded like a book I would buy. Um, I wasn't sure if I was the right person to do it, um, but it, I kept thinking back to that article on how much I enjoyed my time working on it. And it was just, a, it was a subject I was so curious about. So my, so I talked to this agent and she suggested just spend some time there, go there, see what you think, um, see how it feels. And so I did that in the fall of 2019 and I, I went, it was cold. Anybody who knows that part of um, Massachusetts, of course, knows that that is the time that there are fewer, the fewest people there. It was very quiet, very cold. But I met some really, oh, can some, say some of you are not hearing me. Um, but I, I met some really incredible, very open, kind people who um, really gave me the confidence that this was a subject that I could tackle and that I wanted to tackle. Um, and so that's that's what got that's what that's, that what started this whole process. So I'm going to share with you um, um, a little bit of uh, some background on the whole book before I more before I launch into it. So here is a peek at my last few years. Um, I wrote this book. I signed my book deal in uh, March of 2020, and I had two years to write it. Hence the masks in every photo. So I really wrote this during kind of the 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 you know the worst parts of the pandemic. Um, the upper left hand corner is uh, me with my son going on the the boat cruise that goes shows the Kennedy compound houses that started back in the '60s and it continues today. So that's us taking that tour. Um, the photo on the right is me going sailing with Max Kennedy. I spoke to about a dozen members of the Kennedy family for this book. Um, I spoke to about 130 people in total, which included neighbors, friends who came to visit, people who worked in the house, people who worked for the family. Um, so that's me sailing with Max on a very cold fall day in 2020. Um, I reached out to him and I didn't hear back for a while. And I finally heard back from him. I got an email out of the blue and he said, I'll talk to you, but it has to be on my sailboat because you can't understand the Kennedys if you don't understand sailing. So um, I got in the car, as, as Robert said, I'm from New Jersey, I got in my car the next day, the, he was, Max was closing up his house for the season and the, the next week. So he said, it's this weekend or it's not happening. So I got in the car, I went out, went down there and I uh, spent a, 
lovely few hours with him and his his uh, wife and his friends on on the sailboat. Um, and that picture in the me in the middle is me digging through the archives all across Cape Cod. Um, it's a book that covers a hundred years of the family. So I spoke to as many people as I could, but um, to get a lot of the context of those early years, um, I really had to dig deep into the archives. That's that's the Sturgis Library for anybody who uh, knows the library system in Cape Cod. It's a, an absolutely wonderful, incredibly helpful library. Um, I, would, I dug through the old newspaper archives there. Um, and found unpublished books and things like that, which really helped me uh, understand the context of Highness Port and as it and its history and as it changed. Um, to me, it's a book. It's a book about the Kennedys, of course, but it's really more than anything else. It's a book about a place and a book about community. So, for every Kennedy story I was told or found, I made sure that I did the research to understand what was happening. Um, across Cape Cod, but specifically in Hyannis and Hyannis Port to give the stories context. So it was looking at things like weather reports and newspaper archives to understand what was happening in town the day that a big event happened, that kind of thing. So the story starts back 100 years ago in the 1920s. Um, the Kennedy family, Joe and Rose Kennedy, uh, the two of them grew up in Boston and they spent their summers on the beaches of mostly of Maine. Um, with their families to get away from the Boston heat. And the, the, they, Joe and Rose actually met um, on the beach and years later fell in love on the beach. And once they got married, they started looking for a place to take their own family uh, in the summers. They started their search in Cohasset and um, Joe Kennedy applied, he, they rented a house there. Joe Kennedy applied for uh, to be a member of the golf club there and was turned down on account of being Irish Catholic. So they kind of continued further and further out the, at, out the Cape and of running houses, trying to kind of decide where they wanted to put down roots for their summers. Um, it was a shopping trip in Hyannis that actually introduced them to the, to the area. And eventually they rented a little house called the Malcolm Cottage. This is the, um, the backyard of the Malcolm Cottage. That's, uh, I, should have I should tell you guys who is in, in this photo. Um, that's Rosemary, that's Rosemary Kennedy, JFK, uh, Eunice, um, Joe Jr., and Kit Kennedy, I believe I have those right. And that's in the Centerville Beach. Um, if anyone knows the area, is pretty close to Highness Port. So this is the backyard of the Malcolm Cottage. That's JFK and his older brother, Joe Jr. Um, that, the Malcolm Cottage was a lovely cottage at the end of the Stead End Street that overlooked Nantucket Sound. And they rented it for a few summers and loved it. Um, and they decided Joe became a member of the Highness Port Club, which is a, a beautiful golf golf club up on the hill in Highness Port. Uh, he applied and was accepted. And um, they decided they wanted to buy a house. And they thought about uh, the big house next door, which anybody who's been to Highness Port, if you've noticed a big house with huge columns that's very stately looking, most people assume that is the, the main house of the Kennedy compound. It is not, it's the neighbors. Um, Joe thought about buying that house, but it was really his wife, Rose Kennedy, who loved the Malcolm Cottage um, enough that she, she um, encouraged them to, to have that be the house that they bought. She loved the flat lawn in the back, which is, you know, over the years become famous for where the family played touch football. Um, she loved that it was open on the open water and that it had this beautiful wraparound porch where she could sit and watch the kids play and watch them swim, which has reminded her of kind of memories of her own childhood. So they ended up buying that house um, in 1929, doing a massive renovation, doubling it in size. Part of that renovation um, involved turning the basement into uh, a working movie theater, really like no, none other in New England at that time. It was an incredibly impressive um, basement once they did this renovation. Um, Joe Kennedy at the time was working in movies and so it was important for him that he have kind of the state of the art uh, technology when it came to, the, to, to his at, at home theater. And they would invite uh, the family friends, the neighbors, people who work for them into the basement, which fit about 40 or 50 people in this basement theater. So here's a picture of the theater. You see um, JFK and his brother, Joe Jr. and some of the neighbors 
Um, on the right in the beautiful flower dress is, the neighbor, is their neighbor, Nancy Tenney, who lived, who moved in the same year that they moved in. Anyone who's read the book yet knows that Nancy was uh, an important, important friend to the family um, right there at the end of Marchant Avenue. Um, this is uh, Joe Kennedy, the, the patriarch of the family. This, this picture brings us past, um, past the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, um, after uh, the family lost their oldest son, Joe Jr., in the war and lost their daughter, Kick, in an airplane accident. Um, and after those losses, Joe Kennedy decided he wanted to take more than $100,000 and put it back into the community. He called a family friend and said, I want to do something with this money to honor my son, and I want it to be something for the children in the community. What do you have in mind? Um, and they came up with this idea. They asked actually students in the community for suggestions, and they came up with this idea to uh, create a skating rink. Um, oh, excuse me. Yeah, I thought I had a picture of that. But yeah, they, so they created the skating rink that they called the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Um, ice skating rink center, I believe it was called, and it's now uh, a community center. So the, it's changed over the years, but the, it's the kind of the area is still, is still there. Um, but that's him making the announcement of the dedication. Um, I, I've been often asked in my, my few weeks talking about the book, who did I, you know, who did I most like in the family? Who did I most like learning about? Who surprised me? Um, this is Rose Kennedy. She's one who I really, um, who I was, who surprised me over the course of my research and who I really enjoyed learning about. Um, Rose Kennedy is, is a historical figure who I think most people are familiar with that she's, I think when you, if you were to, to ask kind of a Kennedy reader, or just a, casual, a follower of history, you know, what do you think, what do you know about Rose Kennedy? I think that people know her as this very stoic matriarch. Um, her family endured a horrific tragedy, um, but, and she was kind of this brave public face, um, a mother who lost so much. And what I found really interesting about Rose when seeing her through the, the prism of Hyena Sport is I really was able to kind of see her more as a neighbor, as a friend, as a mom. Um, she was able to kind of let her guard down in ways that I think you, you rarely see with her in other books. Um, she, there's a, uh, lovely anecdote that I dug up that she had this beautiful house. They had done this huge renovation. And after that, they had this little hut built on the edge of the property, um, where she would kind of go to get away when it was too noisy, too hectic in the house. And she gave a great quote to a magazine reporter, um, at the time saying, something along, I don't have the quote in front of me, but something along the lines of, um, with, you know, it's not splendor that a mother needs, it's solitary confinement. And as a, as a parent of a, a six-year-old who's being put to bed in the next room, I can say it was, as a mom, it was kind of fun to see that side of her um, in my research. I, I found her really interesting. She also opened up to neighbors. I mentioned Nancy Tenney was a neighbor or in one of the earlier slides. Nancy's a neighbor who Rose opens up to in the book um, in ways that you really, we really haven't seen her open up um, before. Um, as, I, as I said, this is a book about the Kennedys, but it's really a book about this community, this very tight-knit um, private community. And I really enjoyed learning about the other members of the community who had a big impact on on the community and also on the Kennedys in ways that really haven't been written about before. This is Eugenia Forts. Um, if anybody has been to Hyannis Port, you know, you probably know the name because the, the only public beach in Hyannis Port is named not for the Kennedys, as I think a lot of people would expect with, that's the family you kind of associate the most with, with Hyannis Port, but it's actually named for Eugenia Forts, who is an incredibly important member of this community. She was one of the founding members of the Cape Cod chapter of the NAACP. Um, and she fought very hard to keep that beach public after attempts to um, to make it private over the years. She fought really hard to keep it public, and that's why it's named for her. Um, and I tell stories in the book about the in, the influence and impact she had on on the family as well. She was she's an incredibly interesting, um, important historical figure. So this takes us up uh, to the 1950s. This is uh, Jackie at the time, uh, Jackie's first trip to uh, the so-called Kennedy compound, even though it wasn't being called that at the time. Um, but she came back, she was engaged to JFK and they flew back to Highness Port to celebrate. 
and it was reported in the newspapers at the time. JFK was, of course, a kind of very kind of budding, budding popular um, uh, junior senator. And so he brought her back to the house to meet his family. And they brought along with them a photographer uh, to kind of document this this weekend. And there were also local photographers there to capture the whole thing. And when you look back at the hundred years, um, the sense that I got was really that this is when things kind of really started to change for that little tiny private little street that suddenly, um, you know, this is a family that was drawing attention over the years. Joe Kennedy was an ambassador. He had worked in Hollywood. Um, the political career of JFK was kind of getting going. So there was some attention there. But when Jackie came back and they brought this photographer and local press all came by, you really started to, to start to see you know, the end of Marchant Avenue where the where the house is, you start to see where the, the photographers and the reporters start to stand to get their quotes and have remained there for so many decades since. Um, but this is really when when that whole thing got started. Here's a peek inside the house, one of the houses. This is the big house. Um, and you see how it overlooks Nantucket Sound there in the back. It's uh, the beautiful view. At this, at this time, um, as we're getting towards the end of the 1950s, uh, JFK and Jackie have, uh, have been married and they've bought the house kind of catty corner to the big house. So the main house is what, they, what they, the family calls the big house. Um, kind of catty corner back on the street behind them is, uh, was the, the house that JFK and Jackie bought. And then the house right behind the big house, kind of in between the two was the house um, that was purchased um, for Bobby Kennedy and his wife Ethel once once they were married, and the three houses are connected by a lawn, so you can kind of walk barefoot, you know, from house to house, from lawn to lawn, without ever going onto the street. Um, they're kind of connected on a corner, but the big house is the only one overlooking the water, and this gives you a sense of that. Um, so, of course, this is, I talked about things changing in the 50s, but in 1960, of course, um, it really changed when JFK became president. So I'm going to read a little passage of the book, from the book of Election Night. Um, so when, uh, after uh, JFK cast his vote in, uh, in Boston, they came back to Hyannisport to wait for the returns to come in. And the kind of the center of all of that was at his brother Bobby's house. It was, they um, brought in extra phone lines and they kind of set up a station up um, for all of the, for, for calls to come in to deal with the, with the media. Most of the media was stationed down at the armory in, uh, in Hyannis, a couple miles away. Um, so they kind of were kept, they kept their distance. And then the, a lot of the kids went over to the big house uh, where they had a sleepover with their grandparents. Um, but Bobby's house is really kind of the center of all the activity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Back at Bobby's place, the mood had shifted from exuberant to tense. The race was becoming tight and uneven. Jack was losing in Wisconsin, Ohio, and Tennessee. An urn of hot coffee was set up on Bobby's sun porch, preparation for a long night. Morton Downey, who is uh, the family friend who you probably might recognize that name was the uh, Irish tenor who was friends with Joe Kennedy. Martin, Martin Downey sat quietly eating the sandwiches he'd been passing around earlier. Jack went up the stairs to his house to kiss Jackie goodnight. Then Eunice, Pat and Jean came over to see her, each taking a turn, hugging her, telling her to sleep well, that they were going to stay up all night. It was midnight when Jack walked over to Bobby's. He paced the first floor, his eyes fixed on a television. By 2 a.m., the Kennedy lead was down to less than a million vote votes. By 3.15 a.m., Vice President Nixon appeared on TV at his headquarters to chants of, we want Nixon. Jack still had more votes, but the race hadn't been called and Nixon didn't concede. Nixon smiled as he thanked his supporters and volunteers. Jack walked over to his future press secretary, Pierre Salinger, to say, tell the press I'm going to get some sleep and I won't be making any statements at this time. He walked through the kitchen out onto the connecting lawns back to his house in the black night. His sister Pat watched him fade away and whispered, good night, Mr. President. He walked up the stairs to his room and fell right asleep. 3 a.m. turned into four at the command center and Teddy and Bobby, their crisp white button-up shirts now wrinkled, their sleeves sloppily rolled, stared expressionless at a television. The next morning as the sun rose, Bobby's house was quiet except for the sizzle of bacon coming from the kitchen. Ethel had woken up before seven to make everyone bre breakfast. Slowly as the smell of the grease wafted upstairs, people made their way down. Bobby and Teddy went to Marchant Avenue to throw the football back and forth for a while. 
On Irving Avenue, three-year-old Caroline and her nanny Maud Shaw were the first ones up. Caroline ate her cornflakes in her room so as not to wake anyone. And Shaw noticed a man in a dark suit standing outside the window. He didn't look familiar. Then it dawned on her. He's Secret Service. Jack must have won. Caroline insisted on going to wake up her father then. When you wake him up, I want you to give him a nice surprise, Shaw told the little girl. Will you say, good morning, Mr. President, this time? They went down the hall and knocked on Jack's door. They cracked open the door to find him sleeping. Good morning, Mr. President, Caroline said excitedly to her father. Well, now, is that right? He said, looking over to Shaw in the doorway. Am I in, Miss Shaw? Of course you are, Mr. President, the nanny told him. He told her to run over to the tel television to read off the latest figures. She did. He was ahead. Jack asked his cousin Anne to take Caroline to ride her horse over at Grandpa's farm. Grandpa's farm is Joe Kennedy's farm over in uh, the neighboring uh, town of Osterville. I wanted him at. I think he wanted her out of the house, quite honestly, Gargan said, laughing when she remembered that morning. The dawn is breaking and the sun is shining, a rumpled reporter said into a camera. The big house stood behind him. The sea right behind it, placid from the protection of the old break wall. It's just the kind of day that's ideal for a game of touch football among the Kennedys. So that gives you a sense of uh, kind of the, the history that took place there in, uh, in 1916. Here's a quick little piece of a video. Let's see if it works. Um, of the helicopter landing. So the people I spoke to in the community uh, remember this so strongly and so viscerally, the memory of the, this, the person from Hyannis Ford, I wonder if you remember this, the airplane or the helicopter coming and landing and uh, the president coming out and the kids, you know, the kids in the family running down to give him hugs and piling onto the golf court cart that they called the, in town, the, the Tunerville trolley. <clears throat> but the kids in town remember not only the family running down to say hi, but the neighbor kids would kind of run down the street and kind of stand at, at the edge of the property to kind of look and see too that this person who, you know, this neighbor to see uh, the president arrive. And it was really kind of an exciting thing on Friday afternoons. The president would stay for the weekend um, before heading back. And you see, this is uh, the family kind of in the backyard of the big house with the with uh, Nantucket Sound behind it. Um, and you get a sense of, um, this is a, such a quiet, it's, you know, such a quiet, small um, community and th the impact that these, th these summer white house years had on it were just um, monumental. Um, also, when uh, he became president, these little white huts went, went up all, all through the neighborhood, which is where the summer cops and the Secret Service uh, would be stationed. Summer cops was a term I was not familiar with before starting working on this book. Um, but because the population of the town ballooned so much in Hyatt's Port in the summers, they would <clears throat> they would bring on additional people to work um, as police officers. I spoke to a number of summer cops who shared wonderful stories with me, um, really great memories of protecting the house during these years and um, just you know how much those years really changed this community. This is the Yachtsman Hotel, <coughs> excuse me, which is now condos, but this is a, it's time as a, as a hotel. But uh, I heard really, really wonderful stories too of the Yachtsman Hotel, which is where the media was stationed during the weekends when the president was there. Um, I talked to um, a man who worked there and he remembered kind of unloading the typewriters for, you know, the biggest uh, media names of the time. And uh, Pierre Salinger, the press secretary, would kind of station himself at the bar at the piano. And he would, he apparently was a beautiful piano player. He would play piano and sing. Um, and the reporters would come and kind of hang out there at the bar uh, after, their, after they were done with their work for the day. And it was quite a lively scene. Um, I also spoke to Alan Alda, the actor Alan Alda, and he, when he was getting his start uh, as a, an actor and as a, his kind of early days in comedy, he worked for this, was part of this comedy troupe that would go down to Highness Port for the weekends and perform for mostly the media who was there. And he would, he told me he remembered having to go to the press conferences and read about the press conferences in the newspaper to kind of know what was going, the kind of the latest things going on, the kind of things that JFK would be asked at these press conferences. And the media would then, the reporters would then at, would ask Alan Alda the same thing. And Alan Alda doing his JFK impression would, would answer and kind of have fun um, with his answers. They had another member of the troupe who did an impression of Khrushchev 
Um, it was really kind of playing off all of the current events and it was, uh, Alan Alda had really funny, fond memories, which I, which I share in the book. And this is Bobby um, with his kids. He would of course come with JFK um, on the helicopter too. Um, it, these were working weekends for the president when he came to Hyena Sport. He, you know, he had fun with his family, sailed, he did all of his things, but this is with some, some of the members of his cabinet for a meeting one weekend. And this is the main living room in his parents' house. The big house had a lot more room for this kind of thing than his house, which is quite a bit smaller. And so you see his, uh, his mom, Rose Kennedy's decorations in the background kind of juxtaposed with these, these men in their suits. Um, this is uh, JFK Jr. He, uh, he, you know, really kind of spent his whole life going to Highness Port. He was one I really enjoyed learning about too. As I mentioned, uh, the whole project kind of got kickstarted with um, a story I wrote about his, uh, his mag magazine, George. And so um, learning about him first kind of as in his career in the media and then kind of going back in time and learning about him growing up in Highness Support, um, I found really interesting. And I'll come back to him in a minute. Um, this is him again with uh, the family athletic coordinator is what they called him, Sandy Eiler. Sandy Eiler uh, was, a, was a really important, uh, another kind of member of the community who was important to the family, the members of the family I spoke to and their neighbors have very strong members of uh, memories of Sandy. Um, he would wake them up early in the mornings and take them swimming, um, get their breakfast ready. He would bring in other kids from the community to set up games of baseball on the president's lawn was where the baseball field was and they would do football, touch football on the big house lawn. That was always, the big house lawn was always the place for the touch football it can, that continued through the generations. Um, but Sandy Eiler was, uh, this man who lived in town who had, had an enormous impact on this family, kind of teaching them sports and kind of looking after them. It's kind of like, a, I call him kind of like a one man summer camp um, for, the, for the kids in this family and, the, and their neighbors as well. Here's another kind of peek inside the house. This is a birthday party. Uh, there's JFK in the forefront. You see Ted Kennedy and Bobby, um, with his wife Ethel and Pat Kennedy. And there's Joan Kennedy kind of poking out in the back. Um, this is this is Bradford's hardware, which is still there, but this is a, a picture of it from back uh, many years ago. Brad, so Bradford's hardware was kind of a funny one to, to learn about as well. Um, Eunice Kennedy Shriver's husband, uh, his name was Sergeant Shriver, was, was one, this was Sergeant Shriver's hangout. So I kind of learned in my research that the Kennedy compound could be it could be kind of a, a tricky place for in-laws. I mean, the Kennedys were a very tight-knit, very loud, very competitive family. And coming in as an in-law, it could be it could be intimidating. Um, Sergeant Shriver um, was was kind of quieter, I, I was told, than his wife. And this was that he was always kind of tinkering with the boat, tinkering with like the little things around the house. And he always found some reason to go to Bradford's hardware, there was always some reason something was broken, something needed to be fixed um, to give him an excuse to make the trip to Bradford's hardware, excuse me, where he knew everybody who worked there and they all knew him. And so as soon as he walked in, he was warmly welcomed. Everyone would you know, be so excited to see Sarge. Um, and he remembered all their names and family members' names and birthdays and all of those things because he, this was kind of his, his, his hidden kind of hangout, which I thought was kind of fun to learn about. Um, here's another another quick video. Um, one of the houses that doesn't get get much attention is this house on Squaw Island, which is this little tiny little spit of land off of Highness Port. Um, the first summer that JFK was president, they spent the summer at, at the house that he the family his family spent their summer at their house, the one they owned on the Kennedy compound. Um, but the there was such a crush of media attention. Um, and just tourists and everything else that they you know tour buses started going by the house those boats that I mentioned started going around the back. Um, so for additional security, the family moved first to Morton Downey's house they borrowed it for the sum for one summer and then for the third summer that he was president they rented this house that's called Bramble Tide. Um, a big, beautiful house on the water in Squaw Island. Squaw Island was kind of easier um, for security purposes. It, there's only one road going in, the same road that goes in as the road that goes out. So it was easier to kind of secure it. 
Um, so this is the third summer they were there at Bramble Tide. Um, the family that owned that home, Bramble Tide, really had managed to fend off media for decades and decades and decades. They really never talked about this house. So it's very rarely mentioned. Um, and I was able to talk to that family and they shared really wonderful stories about how important this house was to their family as well. Um, the Kennedys loved it so much they wanted to buy it, but the family that owned that house um, didn't want to sell it. So, so they didn't, um, but it's the family, uh, Jackie in particular really loved their time here on, on uh, Swat Island at Bramble Tide. This are, there are a lot of dogs in the family too. There are a lot of stories about, about dogs. This is the uh, White House dog handler who they brought with them that summer um, to, take, to help take care of all of these dogs they brought. Um, excuse me, with the Kennedys and all that attention came celebrities to Hyena Sport. Uh, this is a photo of Frank Sinatra and his, at the time, young girlfriend, Mia Farrow. Excuse me. This picture actually was taken after JFK, after JFK's death. Um, they came via an enormous yacht to come pay their respects and, and spend time with Joe Kennedy after uh, JFK's death. So the, the, the people in the community, the neighbors remember this moment very clearly as well. I was told really vivid memories of this absolutely enormous boat coming and docking behind uh, the big house and um, Frank Sinatra and Mia Farrow taking their little boat to come into town and Mia Farrow going to the little uh, new shop, which is where, you know, they sold newspaper and newspapers and penny candy and ice cream. Um, and the Kennedys took took bo a boat back out to the yacht that evening and they grilled steaks and kind of had drinks and uh, spent time together. But the neighbors remember it, remember it very clearly as well. Um, more celebrities, this brings us up to the 1980s. <clears throat> this, the 1980s, were, was a, that was kind of a festive de decade in Hyena Sport for the family. It was when Caroline Kennedy got married there and her cousin Maria Shriver famous got married famously got married to Arnold Schwarzenegger, which was an absolutely enormous event. Um, this these are just two of the many many famous guests. This this uh, this is Andy Warhol and his uh, date Grace Jones, who arrived fashionably late, making qu uh, quite a little scene when they showed up to the church. Andy Warhol later wrote in his diaries that he'd never seen a scene like this in a church before. Um, Oprah spoke at the wedding. Diane Sawyer, Sawyer was there. It was truly a star-studded event. Um, this comes back to JFK Jr. The family, of course, J Highness Forest was a place for you know huge celebrations. You know JFK being elected there. You know being there when he found out he was elected president. The, these these weddings. There was so much kind of joy. In Highness Sport, there was also an incredible amount of tragedy. Um, Highness Sport is where JFK was flying the night that his plane went down, um, which I talk about that that night in the book. Um, so it's, Highness Sport is also a place where the family has co come over the years to grieve. Um, and this JFK, the, the kind of the days after the plane went down was was a really kind of vivid memory for a lot of the, the family members and the neighbors I spoke to. Um, for obviously for terrible reasons, the media to really descended upon Highness Port in those days where they were kind of waiting for more information about what happened to the plane. Um, and I learned in my research that uh, JFK and his wife were spending more and more time in Highness Port before the, uh, their death, the, the deaths that they were renovating that house. Um, JFK actually is the one who was after his, after his dad died and after his mom, um, Jackie, moved to, to, excuse me, Martha's Vineyard to spend more time there. JFK Jr. spent a lot of his time in that house with his wife, Carolyn, um, and she really loved that house too. So they were, they were renovating it. They were planning to meet with interior designer uh, actually the weekend that the, that their plane went down. And it, that was a, a tragic event that had, has, has, you know, stayed, stayed in the minds of many of the people in the community who were very close to him. Um, this is, this brings us up to today and actually I'm going to go back a minute to this one. This is all, this particular picture was, uh, takes place earlier in, uh, John's life. He, I, I have really have a very fun story in the book about, uh, one of the summers after he graduated from Brown, where he worked on a, um, scuba salvage boat 
and they were looking for a buried pirate treasure and they he came across kind of one of the first hints that there was uh there was buried pirate treasure off the coast of um of Cape Cod so that's a very that's a very fun memory to, to um of his there and like I said, this brings us up to today. Um, I mentioned Max Kennedy earlier. He's the one in the yellow jacket. He's the one who took me sailing. Uh, he um, Sailing is incredibly important to him, but really to all of the family. And it has been. J Joe Kennedy was not a sailor, but his kids were. So JFK in that generation is really the generation that started uh, this, you know, this sailing tradition for the family. Um, you know, the family... I, I spent time, you know, with their, in their homes, going sailing with them, going through photos and things like that. And they were always, you know, clear to tell me that they are not a family that does a ton of reminiscing. This is a family that has an, an incredibly rich history and they try not to look back to too much. They try to look forward, but there are certain traditions that have continued over the generations, over the years, and they continue coming back to hyena support. It's hard to put an exact number on it because some of the family rents houses and um, some own and over the years they've bought houses in the community and things like that but you know close to 10 or a dozen houses or so of the Kennedys across Hyena support these days something something around that number um, and I asked them you know there's this this lot there's this lovely museum in town but there continue to be boat tours the family is so closely associated with Hyena support there have been so many tragedies as, as well as the good times there. Why, did, why do they keep coming back here? Like a lot of them have moved across the country. Some members of the family live in California on the beach themselves. Why continue to come here? And the answer was very simple and you know very relatable as for, for myself, particularly as a parent, that this is this is where the family family comes. This is how their their kids know each other. And they told me that the families they don't all come there still. You know, some some of the members, it's a huge sprawling family. So some of them have other places they they spend their vacations and their summers, but the ones who do come to Highness Port, who do continue to spend their time there, that those are the cousins that kind of know each other the best. And I really kind of saw that in my time there. I would be doing an interview on a porch and a cousin would come over to borrow a bike helmet or come over to ask where another cousin was. And um, the houses are fairly close together. There aren't big fences. There aren't big hedges. It's, it's all pretty open, which is what the family loves about it. I was told, and um, that kind of barefoot running in and out of houses, um, spending time with the cousins, going sailing together, piling in, you know, way too many people on a sailboat. That's the kind of thing, that's what they love about it. And that's why they keep coming. Um, and this is another recent Thanksgiving. Um, the, uh, the touch, this is the touch football kind of tradition continuing in the family. Um, the house that you see in the background is actually not the Kennedy, the not the big house, not one of the Kennedy compound houses. That's the one I mentioned that ne it's next door that many people think is is the the big house, but is their neighbor's house. Um, but this um, this is that flat field that Rose Kennedy loves so much about it, and um, the, the the this is one of the the traditions that continues. So that brings us up to today, and I'm at about I'm close to 45 minutes. Um, so I'm happy and excited to take questions. In my time doing these talks, I've had so many fun, interesting comments from people who had their own experiences with in Highness Porter with the Kennedys and fun questions. So I want to make sure to leave plenty of room for that. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Wonderful presentation. We greatly appreciate it. So folks, as Kate said, if you have any questions for her, please type them into the Q&A. If you have any comments for Kate, please type them into the chat. And uh, we'll take about 15 minutes and, and uh, address them all. Uh, so an anonymous attendee says, great presentation. And uh, they ask, did your research include any resources on Jackie Kennedy from the National First Ladies Library in Canton, Ohio? No, that's such a great question. And it didn't. Um, I, as I mentioned, I did this project basically during COVID. And so a lot of the, even the JFK library was closed to researchers. Um, so I was having to rely on the 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 libraries and the museums and things like that that had people who were kind of going in from time to time to dig into the archives for me that were able to like take scans and things like that for me so my my research was um was had higher hurdles than I think I expected it to have when I first started on this project and that isn't so that is what, not what I worked with but that's um that's a great resource uh, Nancy asks, uh, did both Joe Sr. and Rose pass away in the big house? Uh, oh, good question. Did, did, Ted Kennedy did. Uh, Rose, Joe, Joe Kennedy Sr. did. 
Rose did not, I don't believe. I don't believe. Good question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Kim asks, who owns the house now? So there are technically three houses that make up the Kennedy compound, as I said, like the, in the net, in the National Historic Register. Um, the big house, which is probably the one you're, you're referring to, is owned by the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for U.S. Senate. Uh, Rose Kennedy, during her lifetime, hoped that it would turn into a historic house, that it could be toured, that kind of thing. Um, it's a very difficult property. It's uh, at the end of a short private dead end road and the, as I mentioned the houses are pretty close together you, there's really like nowhere for a parking lot or anything like that um uh, so it is now owned by that institution and they're kind of in the process of figuring out what to do with it the for the past decade or so it's been used for private events hosted by the family for the most part um and they're kind of trying to figure out what to do with it next and the other two houses so Ethel Kennedy still lives in the house that she bought with Bobby. Um, she continues to spend her time there. And then the house, the president's house is owned by a member of the family. It's a private home. Uh, Ethan asks, how, how far did any of the family sailing trips go? Their day trips, their offshore islands, anything else about them sailing that you find interesting? Yeah, that's a good question. One of the biggest sailing trips was actually after, um, after Bobby's death, Ted Kennedy basically spent that entire summer sailing. He they rented a bigger sailboat than was the one the sailboats they normally use, which are not that big. Um, they rent, he rented an enormous sailboat and brought the family on. And I'm forgetting exactly the route that they went on. I mentioned it in the book, but they he would kind of go pick up family along the way, and they just they, that was such a intense summer there were moments where he would just kind of go off by himself and walk and then moments where he would be kind of jubilant with his family kind of grateful to spend time with the family that was still there and it was from from what from my what I recall of my research about the sailing that big trip around Cape Cod and I forget where else it went was one of the bigger sailing trips. Uh, Nancy says I enjoyed your presentation so much that I purchased your book thank oh, you. Thank you thank you very much. I hope uh, you like him would like yeah, I'm, I'm sure she will. Uh, Kim <laughs> asks, what's the value of the house? What's the current value of the house? Do you happen to know that? Oh, gosh, that's a really good question. That The big house would be hard to determine. I don't know that at the top of my head. I did. I pulled all the property records. Um, and I feel like, I don't want to get it wrong, but I feel like the president's house was valued at somewhere close to $2 million, I think. I, and, I, and I don't know the big house since that's been owned by, that has not changed hands in, in so many years. That would be a hard one to, to know. Uh, Jane says, I loved your book. Uh, I wondered how a young person like yourself got interested in this topic. I know you touched on this a little bit at the beginning, but do you want to uh, uh, delve in a little more on that? Yeah, I've been asked that question a lot. It's a funny one. Um, I really, I'm from, my, my family is from the South. My family is not from New England. Um, so I did not grow up knowing a ton about the Kennedys. Um, my dad would bring home People magazine and Vanity Fair magazine, those magazines from his office, I remember as a kid. And so I would kind of dig into those. And so I knew about kind of the, the more salacious kind of over the top stories. I knew about Jackie because she was a person always written about in those magazines. So I had kind of a just a curiosity, particularly as a person who then went on to write about politics and pop culture. This That's a family who kind of embodies those, those two topics. Um, and I... Over, over in my years writing for magazines, I've written for many magazines and I was assigned Kennedy stories over the years. Um, and the more I read about them, the more I was interested in them. And I mean, it's just such an incredible, it's just the family story is just, it's incredible. It's, uh, and so I just kind of, it kind of came to me naturally and then was assigned that, uh, worked on that George Magazine story. But what I found really interesting, the age thing is funny. I'm in my late thirties. And a lot of my friends who are, are similar age have been reading the book because I wrote it. So, you know, they're reading it and they, um, and they're loving it. They're really enjoying it. And they're kind of texting me questions about, they didn't know about Rosemary Kennedy, who I talk about a lot in the book, these things like Chappaquiddick, they didn't know about those things I did know about because I, as I said, I'm a, a long time kind of magazine reader, but my friends who are learning about them for the first time through my book are now like, well, what should I read next about the family? And they're kind of newly interested in them as well. Very cool. Uh, anonymous attendee wants to know, did you talk with Ethel about her memories in Hyannisport? I sadly didn't. I really wish I'd been able to. Um, she is kind of up there in, in years. I spoke to many of her children. 
Um, and she, they told me she's not really doing interviews anymore. So I spoke to her children and I've spent time in her home, but Sally didn't get to talk to Ethel. Yeah, and a follow-up question from Nancy. Uh, did you interview Carolyn Kennedy or Caroline Kennedy? And does she uh, return to, Hy to Hyannis with her children and grandchildren? Yeah, Caroline is another one who does not do many interviews these uh, these days, the ambassador. Um, so I did not speak to her. She, from my research, Hyannis Port was obviously an, an enormous part, part of her childhood, but did not has not spent a ton of time there as an adult. I spoke to a lot of the members of the family and neighbors who, I mean, she comes, of course, for big events and she was married there. Um, but has but spends more time in the Hamptons for from my from my understanding. Um, her brother was the one who really kind of embraced that house. Sure. Uh, Kelly says, thank you for this presentation. Do you think you'll continue to be in touch with the Kennedy family? I maybe. I, I've covered such a range of topics in my career. I, I don't see myself continuing to write specifically about the Kennedys. I can see myself writing about, like, I really enjoyed thinking about a place, like an important place. I could see myself covering that. And I can see my, I mean, they've been very opening, very welcoming. Um, they were they were really lovely to work with. So in that capacity, maybe, but um, I don't know. We'll see, I guess. Uh, Rosamond says, great program. Thank you. Mariette says, I really enjoyed this program. Thank you. Uh, Vigo uh, asks, did you talk to the neighbors about their opinions on the Chappaquiddick incident? I did. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, that was that was a, a very intense. I talked to the neighbor across the street. She remembered very specifically um, before knowing anything that had happened. It kind of took a while for that the news of what happened that night to come out in the media. Um, but she remembered like the black town cars kind of like suddenly descending down the street. Um, and it was kind of later came out that the, they called the family called the men who'd worked very closely with JFK and Bobby Kennedy to kind of help deal with the aftermath and the fallout of that incident. And so she remembers those cars coming down the street and they were, there are neighbors who remember there were the, that big, the, if you, the, the kind of the picture of Chappaquiddick is Ted Kennedy speaking, doing this kind of press conference on TV, um, kind of nervously talking about it. That was filmed at the big house, actually, which I talk about in the book. Um, and I had this scene in the book of like the kid, the cousins kind of riding their bikes out in front of the house and the reporters kind of trying to get quotes from the kids and really anybody who would talk. So I do, I do go into that in the book. So everything in society today goes back to Taylor Swift. Hazel would like to know any information about Taylor Swift. I know that uh, Taylor dated one of the Kennedys recently. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Taylor bought the house. I mentioned Nanny, Nancy Tenney, the neighbor, a couple of times in the presentation, who I was a really interesting character. Um, Taylor bought Nancy Tenney's house. So when she was dating Connor, she bought that house. She did not have it for very long. She flipped it within less than a year, turned a massive profit, which I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, absolutely. She, they, I talked to the guy who owns the ice cream shop, who remembers them coming in to get ice cream together and neighbors who remember her playing volleyball in the yard. And um, yeah, yeah, Taylor's in there. Uh, so let's see here. Um, uh, Kim, Kim and uh, Lori both say thank you. Kim enjoyed it very much. Patricia says, great talk. I just ordered the book. Cannot wait to receive it. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. So, Kate, I think we've gone through all questions and comments. I think we knocked out about a dozen questions there. Uh, let me circle back to you in about 20 seconds. But, uh, folks, thank you all so much for joining us. Look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to the recording, a link to a feedback survey, a link to purchase a copy of uh, Kate's wonderful New York Times bestselling book uh, from Wellesley Books, our official bookstore partner, uh, and also information about some other upcoming virtual author visits will be in that email tomorrow morning around 10-ish or so. Uh, so Kate, do you have any last words for us before we wrap it up? No, this was so much fun and those were really great questions. And I really appreciate everyone who uh, logged, on, logged in for it. Yeah, so thank you so much, Kate. Congratulations on the success of your book. And uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night.